My guest today on the CoachCast is Dr. Andy Pruitt, whose professional legacy includes the pioneering of 3D bike fits, three patents for the development of specialized body geometry shoes and saddles, all of which are designed to help optimize performance and comfort based on an individual anatomy. Dr. Pruitt has spent his entire career helping thousands of riders, from Tour de France contenders to local racers, achieve their own brand of freedom and comfort on the bike. He served as Director of Sports Medicine at the University of Colorado, as well as being a founder and director of the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine. He has also served as Chief Medical Officer for USA Cycling and Chief Medical Officer for Cycling Venues at the Atlanta Olympics. I hope you enjoy this episode and learn a few tips that can help you become more comfortable and safe on the bike. Dr. Andy Pruitt, I'm going to call you Andy from here on out. Is that uh, a okay? It's absolutely appropriate. Okay, I've been doing that for a couple of decades now, and three uh, or four of them probably. I was actually trying to think the last or the very first time I had a bike fit by you. It was in Boulder Center for Sports Medicine, and it probably was like late '90s, probably '98 or so. Would that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I've known you. I don't know. Was that before you were coaching Scott or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, I would go in and I'd see Neil Henderson and right? get yeah, yeah, my yeah. zones. I'd yeah, get yeah, tested yeah. and, yeah. um, but did some x-rays with you and sure. found out one leg longer than the other. Sure. And anyways, so I, I've definitely had quite a few and some orthotics along the way too. So, uh, well, it was a great service. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I think we helped a lot of people in those days, you know, it, well, tell us more about those days, you know, how, how do you get to start Boulder Center for Sports yeah. Medicine. And, and I mean, that really kind of kicked everything off, it feels like. But, you know, how do you get to that moment in time to have this genius idea? It, at, at the time, it was genius, you know, it really Absolutely. didn't exist. And, and I, I'll try to sum this up as quickly and coherently as I can. So my career started out in sideline medicine, traditional sports medicine. I was the guy that ran out on the football field at CU yeah. when somebody went down. Right? Yeah. Um, and I had an idea. Practical practical hands-on oh my gosh yeah i mean i you talk about triage it was on yeah. on the it's not lay, theory no no at all that guy just got hit and i saw his <laughs> knee go the wrong direction right so yeah. um but boulder is a unique place uh we had the boulder boulder we had uh, the red zinger of course classic yeah. and so boulder was this magnet um for post collegiate post olympic or or even olympic athletes we had this huge swarm of Frank Shorters and, you know, two-time Olympic gold medalist, uh, Connie Carpenter, Davis Finney, yeah. all of the Euros would come here to train. So the my training room, uh, the, the athletes would leave at noon to go to the training table. I'd open the back door and the citizens of Boulder would come streaming in. <laughs> and I had this, developed this huge following of non-collegiate but high-level athletes. So I went to the university uh, and said, I think we're onto something here. And, and I think that we could have a revenue stream. I think we'd be a first in the country to do this. I think we should open our athletic training room to the public certain hours of the day, charge yeah. insurance, do the whole thing. And their comment was, we don't want all those goofy citizens in our training room. We don't want those runners and rock climbers. And so I left. <laughs> um, the team physician and I went into partnership in Denver, uh, Western Orthopedics, and yeah. we, we tried to start a small training room like setting. Yeah. And that's when I started working with the uh, Olympic teams, uh, did multiple sports festivals, which was a work up to the Olympics in those days. Uh, many um, in home, uh, in location uh, work at the training center. Um, zeroed in on cycling and endurance athletes. Um, and actually in 1985, uh, Israeli, uh, biomechanist offered me, uh, all of the hardware that was going to take to start to use three dimensional motion capture right. in cycling. And he that. had been working on running and throwing Got it. and he called me, um, Gideon Ariel was his name, huh. uh, very, a man of means. And he gave me all of this hardware. Wow. Uh, and, the, and that day, fifty, seventy thousand dollars worth of hardware. Think about that in today's yeah. dollars. Yeah. He said, all I ask you to do is pick a sport and study it in depth. Huh. And obviously it was cycling. He he says, I'm having trouble with the bike. The dots disappear behind the bike uh. and we can't quite 
you know, they're using yeah. algorithms to figure out, does that dot exit going. that blind spot to make that 3d model? Exactly. Yeah. So that was the same time as black look cleats were just invented. Yeah. And there was an epidemic of cycling knee injuries. So Jim Holmes and I, so black look meaning no, no movement. So you went from a quill, you know, slotted cleat that we, in my early days, we actually nailed I, to the shoe. I, I was going to bring that up. 1982, I was <laughs> yeah. nailing my cleats Absolutely. to Detto Pietro wood Absolutely. wood soles. Absolutely. But yeah. So we so the black look so the, cleat. That was the first. It wasn't really the first. There were a couple other guys that had had a similar concept, but yeah. were unable to market, bring it to market, and actually, you know, uh, yeah. make, make a product yeah. out of it. Yeah. So a look, uh, you know, French look company um, brought it to market. It had zero float. Yeah. So we went from having all of this random float that was built into a sloppy system yeah. to binding, like a ski binding. And, right. and the epidemic of knee injuries. And so Jim Holmes wow. and I, he's, he's on one hand, he's an orthopedic surgeon, and we're inventing surgeries. The arthroscope was brand new. We're inventing surgeries to deal with all this epidemic of tendonitis and things that were happening because of the... Right. So he's inventing surgeries. I'm starting to study how much float is necessary. You know, long comes time. Time solves some of those problems, but gave us others. So here, here we have this partnership with Orthopedic Surgeon. He's right. he's fixing all these guys around the world surgically, and I'm over here in the lab in the afternoon, right. trying to figure out how to stop that. Right. 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 How much float is necessary? What what is the normal kinematics? Um, can we actually have a fixed pedal? Well, now we know we can because we address the arch and the, all the other things that go into the way we pedal a bicycle. So that was 1985. Um, and it just progressed. I started to actually offer 3D motion capture bike fit as a medical service. Um, Project 96, if I were going to go along 10 years, Atlanta. Project 96, I was the... Um, uh, Chief Medical Officer for USA Cycling. Chris Carmichael was the head coach at the time. Lance Armstrong was an athlete. To give yeah. him, uh, George Hincapie, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I started using this new thing I had, 3D image and motion capture, on those guys. And it was part of Project 96. And Project 96 was where we were trying to build the bikes and the athletes simultaneously toward an Olympic Games. Um, that had never been done before. Mm -hmm. Before that, like when... Connie Carpenter won the 84 games, you know, those guys would get their Olympic bikes 48 hours before right. the first race. Right. And, and so th there was a lot of problems with that, that, that method. So we were taking the team pursuit team and trying to build the athletes and the bikes and the perfect positions to all culminate at the Olympic games. Yeah. Um, anyway, so what was it? I don't know. 90 this, things were going pretty well there and I was pretty happy with it, but um, Boulder Community Hospital called in 1995, just before the Olympics, and said they'd like to get into the sports medicine business. And I said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And here's what I perceive. An Olympic training center open to the public with doctors, chiropractors, podiatrists, surgeons, physical therapists, athletic trainers, biomechanists, the whole thing under yeah. one roof, just like at the Olympic Training Center. And they said, okay. Yeah. And there it was. No, that was special. I mean, walking in that door, special. I remember it was very special. It was first kind of world class, first of its kind, and people would travel from the world, you know, to come. Oh, absolutely. Over. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Eddie Merch brought Axel here to see me, <laughs> you know, in those days. No, people came from all over. And actually, Olympic committees from other companies, countries came to view it. Right. Um, and a lot of other cities around the country wanted to come, I finally started charging people to come tour the facility because they were just going to steal my idea and, and go back to Chicago and build one of their own. <laughs> Consulting. So I said, I'm happy to show you around for 1500 bucks you know, for an hour. <laughs> happy, yeah. happy to. But now it's commonplace to have multidisciplinary. Right. You know. And then somehow this evolves into, as I mentioned, consulting, but specialized oh, wow. comes along and you have an idea, they have an idea to to create new product that's really specific to help people alleviate alleviate some of the problems that you're seeing in the lab. I have been, I mean, people tell me I'm a pioneer and a forward thinker. I don't know. I just. Oh, wait, wait. I, I got to pull something up here. Uh -oh. So is this your pioneering 
thoughts and ideas here. Well, there's a lot of them in that all book. Right, Absolutely. All right, all right. And that book still sells today. It was 10, <laughs> 10 years old, that book is. Uh, it's the second go around uh, of a book. And, and um, a lot of the advice in there is still absolutely valid today. Yeah. I, just, I just got a royalty check. So people are still all buying right. it. <laughs> good job. That's always good. But um, I had developed some ways I was treating lower extremity issues on the bike and actually making people more powerful, not only more comfortable, but more powerful that go hand in hand and, um, uh, specialized. I've been working on some early ergonomically correct saddles and had great success. So they wanted to expand that thought process, ergonomic okay. design product yeah. came to me and said, um, if you were going to build a specific shoe for 80% of the public, what would it be? And I, I basically sold them some ideas. Um, and had I known how big it was going to be, I well, really underpriced that. But anyway. But yeah, and your thoughts about the current shoes in the market, what, I mean, what was lacking? Oh, wow. They were just empty boxes, right? They, right. There was nothing biomechanically in them at all. It was, what color are they? Are they a plastic sole? Um, are they a stiff plastic sole? Polyethylene was the kind of the material of the time. Carbon fiber wasn't even a thought yeah. in anybody's mind um for shoes at that time and they were just an empty box and there's a lot so the foot is made for walking and running it is not made for cycling and it's a totally different lever system um and, and running and walking the arch for example stores energy right. gives it back to you when you push off so in the in this pedaling motion if it stores energy when we're pushing down on the pedal it's not it's giving not you energy. It's stealing that right. from you right. at that moment. So uh, you have to be able to mostly control the arch, control the forefoot, and turn the cycling foot into a mostly rigid lever instead of this really flexible, malleable thing that can read on even ground. Right. We want to convert it into something far more, far more rigid. Right. Um, Transfer of power. Absolutely. Transfer and of power and, and keep the knee... Uh, aligned basically over the second toe, if you will, if right. possible. Um, so that we, we tried to eliminate medial lateral, unnecessary medial lateral knee travel, which we'd already discovered was the source of much of the overuse injuries that we were seeing both medially, laterally, and on the front of the knee. So if you can get the knee to stay in alignment like a piston, uh -huh. there's far less friction, far less wasted energy as far as power production goes. But my concern has always been injury prevention and increase in power has been a subset of that. Right. Been a spinoff of that. So. Right. So if we go back a couple minutes, you mentioned yeah. the black look cleat. You bet. We now know you can be fixed, but you're not saying everybody should be, should be fixed. Um, or are you? What are your thoughts around float versus fixed? So the more accurate you control and support the foot, the more the less float you need. So if I think about all my experience in the world tour, right? Over a decade of taking care of the best cyclists in the world, and they want zero float. Yeah. They want zero float. So many of them have gotten to that level because they're perfect biomechanical specimens. Right. But not all of them. So you'd get the guy who has black or, or zero float, I won't even, I won't even brand them anymore, zero float cleats, and he's battling knee pain, hip pain, back pain. We come in and support the arch, support the forefoot, you know, really assess and diagnose what the foot needs to be. And then once you put that right arch support in there, right, the right forefoot support in there, get the cleat rotated in the right place, suddenly they can get by with one or two degrees of float. Yeah. And even the zero float cleats, once they're worn, right, they have zero, one, two, three degrees of float, and your foot is going to move somewhat inside the shoe. So there is some slop in the system, even in the best systems. Yeah. Um, you see a guy, you know, Philippe, for example, um, he, you know, the last 3K, he cranks down those shoes, right? So he, <laughs> you always he, see him do that, he, yeah. he is eliminating the slop in the system. Right. And right? he wants to have zero float right. at that moment. So how does that translate to gravel? The new, you know, I mean, I always go back and forth. I mean, on a lot of courses, I don't need a mountain bike pedal. I could go with my road setup, but then 
does that mess up my position? And, you know, you just pretty much go with the mountain bike pedal because you might break down and have to walk a few miles. <laughs> but I'll, oftentimes I'm on the gravel bike. I want it more fixed, you know, but there is no real good system for that right now. So the, the high end, the really, you know, guys trying to win the gravel race are many times riding road shoes because okay. they're not going to, they're not going to dab. They're not going to flop. Down. Right. Um, you know, my son, well, you know, he did 10 in a row lead bills. Mm -hmm. Holds the record for, he, he has the fastest average bond. time on 10 in a row. Right. Um, wow. But he never put a foot down in a thousand miles. <laughs> and every year I'd say, <laughs> you, you want to think about your road shoes? He goes, the, the day I go to my road shoe, I'm going to dab on power line and have to walk. <laughs> right. Right. The so backup plan. I think you got to be prepared. Right. And many of the. Um, I'm gonna call them mountain bike shoes. They're gravel shoes now, right? I mean, yeah. uh, or recessed cleat, walkable, walkable, high performance shoes. Mm -hmm. However you want to say it, we can we can get that foot as stable inside that shoe. Um, rare that we can get zero float because of the designs yeah. of the SPDs and et cetera. But yeah. but um, I, I think you can run a gravel shoe setup just as locked as you can a road shoe. Huh. Absolutely. Yep. Now, stance width is going to vary, right? Mountain right. bikes, gravel bikes, some of them have a, a wider stance. Yep. So the, how you rotate your cleat needs to be assessed uh, if, your, if your stance is being uh, varied significantly. A couple millimeters, right. I'm not going to worry about right, it. Right. But if it's, if it's 5 millimeters, 10 millimeters in stance width change because you want to put in a big tire, then I think you've got to you've got to really look at your cleat setup for that that particular setup. Yep. So if you're going, yeah, you, know, you might need a pair of shoes that are for your gravel bike and a pair of shoes for your mountain bike. They might be different setups based on for it could position. Be the same model shoe, but different. Oh, setups. of course, yeah, of course. And and the prescription, I always call it a, a prescription inside the shoe, which is an orthotic or a footbed of some type. Uh, there's many over-the-counter footbeds now that really rock, yeah. um, as long as you're choosing the right one. And so if you get that in-shoe prescription dialed, that would stay the same. It's going to be cleat rotation right. that would end medial lateral, you know, stance width is going to change based on the Q angle of the bike you're riding. So width. what would clue somebody in or a coach working with an athlete mm. in terms of this person might need orthotics. I mean, what percentage of cyclists need it or that, you know, from your experience or what might be the indicator showing you should think about orthotics. So orthotic to me is a corrective device, right? And so a knee brace is also known as an orthotic or orthoses, right? So they're a corrective device. Mm -hmm. A footbed is simply something that's going to help take your flexible arch, that's useful for walking and running and, and give it some support and some structure. Uh -huh. So they, they come in all kinds of designs of stiffnesses and arch heights. And, um, I mean, a good running store, a good mountain bike, bike store is going to have a wall of choices for you to go choose the right footbed. Right. And I would, I would encourage that to be done with some professional help. Uh, most of the good shops have a professionally trained fitter that can help you assess how much arch support, or four foot support you actually need. Whether you have problems or any indicators that you need it or not, so, it'll, it'll help. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're, if you've been a, more than a, more than an occasional rider, but you're, you're, you're a four day a week guy. Yeah. And all of a sudden you get this Jones to go do unbound, <laughs> even a hundred bound gravel race. Right. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're riding six days a week and 12 hours a week, 15 hours a week. So you, you may not have had a problem at the four day a week, right? Okay. but you, right. that same issue, that same alignment, Compounded. that same position is going to be uh, more problematic at the higher level. Right. So yeah, I, I just don't, I think there's so much good advice out there uh, as far as coaching advice and, and fit advice, um, shoe choice, foot prescription advice. There's so much good advice out there. There's some charlatans. Don't, don't, let's not, Mm -hmm. think they're not. Mm -hmm. There are some charlatans out there. There's some wannabes or make believers, but there's so much good advice out there that if I were, if somebody listening is thinking about doing their first gravel race or their first Grand Fondo, please 
get some professional advice about training and about your setup. That's great. You know, I mean, we've been talking a lot about road, gravel, sure. triathlon. We have a lot of triathletes you listening. You bet. I mean, in my head, that just confounds so many more, if you will, uh, I don't know, concerns around aerodynamics, mm. um, staying in the position, especially if you're doing a half or a full and yep. however many hours you're going to be out there. Right. Um, how do you balance all that? You know, it, it's just, it, it's just, it, does it make it much more complicated? It's way more complicated. Okay. The arrow position is only arrow if you're in it. Right. Right. If you can hold it. So you go to this aggressive, fast bike fitter, and he says, this, this, man, this looks awesome. Look at this. This is so fast. <laughs> but 45 minutes into your first race, that, that amplitude, your back begins to go and your neck begins to go and you sit up. Yeah. Well, you, the, the arrow position is no longer arrow. Your right. chest right. hitting the wind is right. not arrow. Right. So finding, actually, we always used to teach that there are probably three different uh, time trial positions. And right. and. and the the up the uh, prologue is that is that position it yeah. is is a flat a, prologue <laughs> yeah <laughs> is, not, uh, not flagstaff but. no no but but the 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 event less than right 30 minutes long yeah um all you out. can be all out. all out as arrow as you can possibly be there is a loss of power with aerodynamics and there is a there is a yeah. give and take to yeah. that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if 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 my FTP on my road bike is 240, my FTP on my TT bike is 220 or less. You're willing to give away some watts in order to gain the aerodynamics and that balances out. So much faster, right? Yeah. But finding that sweet spot. So back to the three positions. You've got the 30 minute or less position. Yeah. And that takes you your torso angle to its full forward flex that's 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 achievable yeah and then the the two hour event we want to come up 10 or 15 degrees in torso angle open okay. up open up the hip angle a little bit yeah. and for the and for the long the full iron man we might come up 20 degrees well then you throw in the run component so going for an hour in a 40k time trial mm -hmm. versus 40k time trial and then the 10k run right are you going to make any adjustments there to account for having better run i don't know yeah mechanics form um coming we, off the bike if we filled every chair in this room dirk uh with somebody who knows something about it there would be many differing opinions but this this i think this is me personally the concept of saving something for the run, uh -huh. save my hamstrings, I'm going to save my glutes. I'm going to say, no, be a, I, be a cyclist, I, be a cyclist. Yeah. And because it is so different, it is so different. The, what you're asking of your musculoskeletal system is so different between the run and the ride. I don't think there's they any don't really saving. directly relate. I, I, not in my experience, Yeah, you know, yeah. now if you absolutely drain your tank metabolically, on the bike, right? Your mitochondria are screaming for something to eat, right? They're empty. Yeah. Then you got nothing left for the run. Yeah, it doesn't. It had nothing to do with your bike position. Right. 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 So that that's back to nutrition and all the other aspects of endurance sport. But you've probably worked with triathletes that have sure. been able to adapt over time. Sure. And they go from a less, you know, um, aggressive position to more, I mean, can you work with an athlete and mm -hmm. what type of things might be, or do you prescribe in terms of off the bike? Sure. Mobility, flexibility, any of that? Love the question. So one of the limitations, um, that we have of getting arrow yeah. is, is going to be muscular tenderness, tightness in the hips and the hamstring. Right? Having a job. Sit having a job, <laughs> damn job. Get, get rid of the job. Working for a living ruins a perfectly good lifestyle. <laughs> oh wait, maybe it provides the lifestyle. But, but anyway, um, so to change that range of motion, to make a muscular tendonous unit actually longer. Mm. Um, so muscles are elastic by their nature. That's right. They're they're strands of of actin and myosin protein fibers that glide on one another, and they're in a battery solution, if you will. And then the, 
the electric contraction helps. The okay. So the, yeah. the yeah. muscle belly itself is elastic. The tendon aspect mm. is the transmission of the motor. It is not elastic and it attaches to bone, which is not elastic. Yeah. So can we make that tendinous unit longer? And again, if we filled every chair in this room and talked about the physiology of stretching, we it'd be a, it would be a boisterous debate. Mm -hmm. My belief is, is that we can, to a certain degree, change certain degrees of range of motion around aerodynamics, right? So I think that we can make that tendinous unit longer with persistent, gradual stretching. And the, the military studies have shown it, um, you know, stretch, the, the, there's no value to stretching for injury prevention. There's no value to stretching for increased performance, except if the increased performance comes from an aerodynamic right. basis, right? Right. So if you start a systematic, progressive stretching program, you can see an increase in tendon length. You can it, you can see an increase in your range of your ability. It may take you six weeks to achieve that change, persistent daily stretching. And once you achieve it, you're not out of the woods because it won't stay. Right. Right. As soon as you stop stretching, it's going to go back to its right. pre-prescribed length. Right. Right. So for that aerodynamic athlete, stretching is crucial. I'm, I'm 71 years old and I still love the time trial. I still yeah. love to ride my ship yeah. and I guarantee you I've already stretched my hamstrings today because I can't let it get away because yeah. TT season will be right, be here. Right. And the older you get. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to stay after that. Now, the other piece of lack of range of motion actually is skeletal. So your hips may be a doorstop, a mechanical doorstop. Your lumbar yeah. spine, as it attaches to the pelvis, may be a mechanical doorstop. So there are those athletes who stretch like crazy and never change their range of motion mm -hmm. because it's a mechanical doorstop that's disallowing that. Are you assessing some of that prior to even getting on the bike? I mean... Me as a practitioner? Right. Like oh, absolutely. The mo mobility part of that, oh, even before you do the bike fit. If you go for a bike fit, especially aerodynamic bike fit, and that bike fit does not include a thorough physical examination, then, then you're in the wrong place, right? The, 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 the physical examination is going to, should give them a hint right. as to what's achievable. Some clues. Right. What's achievable today and what's achievable six weeks from now. They, they should know that. Right. And injury history obviously is part of that. Of course. Yeah. What, what's going to hold you back? Oh, let's go, let's go to Lance for a second. Everybody said, my God, that's the ugliest time trial position I've ever seen. He's got that big hump in his back. <laughs> he had a spinal condition that wouldn't allow him to have a, in quotations, flat back. He had this big hump in his back. Right, right. He also had a 80 max VO2, so he could overcome his. Yeah. Uh, but he worked so hard at all the other parts of his physiometry to become aerodynamic. But yeah. he, we, could, we couldn't change his back. Wow. Couldn't change his back. Well, you, you definitely shaped a lot of the, you know, what we know today in bike fitting, you know, sure. the, the, I guess, dynamic versus static yep. bike fit. Yep. Right. Yep. And under load. Yep. I mean, that's become like the standard, right? Crucial. And, Absolutely. and, and measuring that load. Um, and then the 3d component yep. within the, the camera system, where do you see things going? Where do we have opportunity? What are we still learning? What are the thoughts in your head in terms yeah. of what does this look like 20 yeah. years from now? Two years from now. Two years. <laughs> A lot of innovation coming. Look out, um, folks. So it depends on the athlete that we're talking about, right? So do I think that we will have an automated bike fit? with very little human component in the foreseeable or future. Or interpretation or... Comp I think Sorry. the algorithms and the data collection is so deep now okay. that I think the computer could calculate saddle height, saddle fore aft, how many wedges you need in the forefoot, how much arch support you need based on what it has seen so many other... what the computer right. has seen so many other times. So I think that 
that's doable. And that's going to take that 17 year old at the bike shop out of the equation. Who's trying to do your bike flip, right? So there's a certain level of athlete that that's going to be just fine for. Okay. Are you and I going to be satisfied with that? Maybe, maybe not. Is this the middle of the bell curve? Tr- trying Correct. To solve for, okay. Correct. And then we start to work out to the edges Correct. from there. Correct. Algorithms become less okay. accurate the farther we get away from the middle of that bell-shaped curve. So uh, I still think that the world tour rider um, is going to need that human interpretation. So the goal of the athlete plays a part of this. If your goal is your first no doubt. versus podium versus world champion, no doubt. that has a lot to do with how you need to adapt or adjust yep. the bike. Yep. What's the, the guy from Ineos, uh, Brands, Br- Bransford? Uh, Brailsford. Talks about, uh, talks about marginal gains. Right, Dave right? Br- Brailsford. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Marginal gains. And I think if you're a guy looking for marginal gains, there still needs to be that. You know, so let's take an MRI, right. for, for example, right? So an MRI done of a 40-year-old knee, it is not going to be a virginal knee. So it's going to have stuff. It's going to have findings, right? But do those findings correlate to the source of pain that brought the guy to the MRI unit, right? Mm, right. So there's a lot of a lot of noise in that system. Now, you, if you MRI a 17-year-old football player's knee with an acute torn ACL, it's a pristine knee with a torn ACL. There's no noise. It mm-hmm. is clear. The 40-year-old knee, the 50-year-old knee, there's going to be some noise in that system. So I think that the same thing back to this automated bike fit, there's going to be some noise in that system that, that needs a human to, you know, interpret. But I even think the physical evaluation, much of it can be done digitally. Right. So you, you, you can foresee someone being in their basement on their trainer with you and their phone only. And it's assessing and doing the algorithm in the cloud and coming back with the suggestions. Yeah. Is that so what... well, maybe, maybe, maybe not the basement. There's good. Okay. You have to. So if we do a markerless system, so we, there's no um, trained person finding the middle of the joint. And so there's going to be some assumptions made yeah. about where that middle of that joint is. Right. So the more assumptions you make, the less accurate we're going to be. Um, so I'm not sure about the basement, but I have to tell you a funny story. I was, um, I was given a talk in China at the MIT version of China, uh-huh. right? So it is a huge auditorium full of Chinese science nerds right? <laughs> and they're listening intently. It's all being translated in real time. They've got their headphones on. I'm just jabbering away like I normally would. And my slides are, have been translated in Chinese. So I can't, so you have no I can't read them, right? Yeah. I've got to use them like cue cards. Um, the, the, the presentation's over, standing ovation. Everybody, this little guy comes up to me. Can I talk to you, Dr. Bert? He shows me his phone. This guy was developing an automated bike fit system yeah. in an app. Yeah. In China, yeah, five years ago. Wow. <laughs> so, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure that'll come to fruition someday. Yeah, you know, somewhere. somewhere. He said, "What do you think?" And I yeah, said, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It was it was impressive. Well, you you know, if, I, I don't know. Next generation phones, you can walk into a room and it measures the dimensions of the room and sure. all the furniture in it. It'll sure. all from a photo. Sure. So that's gonna end up happening somehow with bike fits. But the, but the furniture static. Right? And the human being is not static. So I still but think computers will get smart enough. Computers are getting mighty smart. That's why I said, <laughs> I think much of the physical evaluation can be uh, digitized. Right. 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 So if we, so this, I'm going to throw out a brand name, Retool. I have mm-hmm. Big influence on that was body geometry fit, which was me turned into Retool. Now it's re- anyway. So um, if we put on the Retool harness, the, yeah. the electric, uh, the little flashing lights, yeah. if you will. And we perform all of the same movements that a physical therapist would have you perform for the camera, right? So your yeah. physical assessment, could be. much of it, if not all of it, right. could be done digitized. Never thought of that. So you've done that yeah, part yeah, yeah. and then you get on the bike. I mean, I, yeah. so 
is it is uh, i think that's a very possible and i don't think it's that far away yeah right that's exciting yeah um but is it still going to be enough for the elite of right. us right i mean right. i'm 71 but it's, i'm still an elite guy in my age group. that's not the middle of the bell curve okay so. all right yeah um <laughs> so nor are you but I think that's coming and that will what i think is so exciting about that is it eliminates the hack it eliminates the hobby fitter it eliminates the guy who's just getting started it allows all retail who invest in this process to have a really high level fit program yep yeah 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 very cool okay a little more off topic yeah what are we doing now that you're i guess officially quasi retired what, oh, what's Lord. your status here and what are you doing these days i'm the worst retiree that it's ever been <laughs> I, I, I failed three times now uh, i retired <laughs> from clinical medicine six years ago uh and retired from consulting but specialized in the body geometry world um over two years ago okay and oh i did some uh, more than dabbling with a cbd company doing some formulations for athletic recovery with cbd that was really a lot of fun and and saw some amazing progress done but there's wow. there's so many shadows in that industry that um uh, it's the, emerging it is emerging <laughs> but there's still a lot of shadowy creatures out there and some not so honest. False advertising exactly, here Exactly, exactly. So uh, I spent two years with a little company called i and and it was, I, I'm still, I would still say I'm still working with them. That was quite fun. Um, Fast Talk Labs is a virtual sports medicine center. Yeah. They're trying to do everything virtually. Um, that's testing. That's all kinds. They're getting ready to offer lots of um, even exam services virtually. So that, that I'm still working yeah. with them, but on a lesser basis, my newest thing is so not me, but I'm so excited about it because it actually saves lives. I spent 40 years saving lifestyles yeah. and my end of my career is going to be actually saving lives. It's a, a company called spoke safety that has a technology that when it becomes global and ubiquitous will allow all cars to see cyclists, let's say vulnerable road users, that right. includes motorcycles, bicycles, wow. scooters, and for those vulnerable road users to actually see the car before it is. Uh, so make the bike an actual vehicle for it once. Is, it is, and it will. <laughs> it's a uh, it's automotive grade chipsets that huh. are both on the bike and in the cars. Uh, we have demonstrated it. Um, uh, we've had an engineering demonstration that we proved it works. Wow. Uh, we're, they partner with Qualcomm and Amazon Web Services, and it's just amazing. Audi, yeah, yeah. Ford, uh, Training That'd Geeks, be... I think, is uh, very near uh, going to be a partner in all of this as well. So the goal would be is that cars see bikes and bikes see cars. Wow. And I mean, you just can imagine the technology is all there. It's just it's there. no one has brought it all together for the bike to finally be seen it, it requires an entire ecosystem it's not as simple as putting a radar on the, on your seat post it's mm -hmm. not that simple i don't want to throw any brands under mm -hmm. the bus but it's not that simple it takes an entire ecosystem it takes the well the, the cloud too i mean oh the cloud is crucial to it right um best case scenario is that i've got a uh a 5g chip in my car and you've got a 5g chip on your bike and and your bike and my car are seeing each other 10 times a second. I mean, that's the a whole kilometer out. That's three. <laughs> and that, that's the holy, that's the holy grail. Right? right, right. But as we get there, I think we've still got to use radar. We've still got to use cameras. We've still got to, um, more and more cars have to be rolling off the assembly line with this technology. Yeah. More and more bikes have to be rolling off the assembly line with this yeah. technology. And we do have a plan for no bike left behind. So there's, there's actually an aftermarket add on Retro, to any yeah. bike. Or yeah. a guy like you and I that have multiple bikes, yeah. right? Um, and there's there's a way to retrofit cars. Um, think about this: the freight and delivery vehicles. If they were all oh. armed, right? Right. All the yeah. freight and delivery vehicles out there. If they were all armed with this technology, how many lives would be saved? Yeah. And they're excited. That yeah. that industry is very excited about what yeah. we're doing. So and this can all happen in the next five years. So it's hopefully coming soon. It'll it'll be live before that yeah yeah that's exciting yeah, really exciting. really cool yeah 
So more future stuff you're working on. I, I always say you're the first generation, you know, kind of godfather of bike fitting. Yeah. And uh, I mean, nobody really did it before you. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate everything you've done because uh, I went and had you work on me many a sure. time and uh, knock on wood. I yeah. came out okay. So. Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> well, you were experimenting with arch mounted cleats one time. We did yeah. a lot of work with you with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Big setback adapter and all kinds of stuff. It was fun. <laughs> I like lots of fun stuff. Well, I, so it's one thing to be challenged by a difficult diagnosis. It's also interesting to be challenged by an athlete going, is this better? Right. Right. Hell, I don't know. How Let's much, find out. <laughs> are oval rings better? We yeah. still don't know. We still don't. But well, they, they're not the taking anything away, maybe. We don't know. That's but we're going that. off. But I think, no, I think that, I think that's a fair assessment. I right? have done a lot of work on oval. Yeah. I rode them for probably five years and Bobby Julek sent me his very, Bobby Julek sent me his rings that he won Perry Nice yeah. with. Yeah. He's like, you got to try these things, man. Yeah. And I, I rode them for the next five years and then it just became too difficult to like keep up with all the next new bike and everything. But well, I, I, I was think fine you, with them. I, well, yeah, you adapted to them. Yeah. You know, yeah. first time I rode them, I felt like an alien had inhabited my body. Was, yeah, it's true. You, you got to oh start God. in November if your race is in April. <laughs> but is it, did it make you faster? Did it make, just because you were successful at yeah. riding because you adapted to them, yeah. doesn't mean they're. I don't know. Chris Room wins the Tour de France oh, with it. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No. Anyways, I'm but, not, uh, I, yeah, fun stuff. There's I, so much I more. I think of that. if we can dial in the, it's a cam, basically. Yeah. So I don't think just bolting them on is the key. I think we have to think about your femur length and your foot length oh, yeah. and dial in where that cam is yeah. to put that bigger virtual, bigger lever in the Optimize, right place. Right. Then I think we're talking about something. just bolting them on. Not so All right. Much. Well, folks, we have a whole lot of cool new stuff coming <laughs> your way in the next two years. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. So you're going to keep working at it. So Andy, thank you so much. That was a pleasure as always. And uh, yeah, we'll see you out on the roads this year. Yes, you will. On the gravel, maybe. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I got some gravel races see planned. You. I got some pavement. Gravel. Everybody get their steamboat. We'll be there. We, but we both will be there. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. You bet that. Thank you, Dirk. Great fun. Thank you.